Well, given the uh, ruminations of Stephen Hawking and Daniel Dennett and Richard Dawkins, one would have thought that the um, absolute limits of scientific arrogance had been reached. But I suppose, I'm afraid we have to think again. Um, a theoretical physicist from the California Institute of Technology called Sean Carroll just wrote a book in which he's argued that science is on the verge of explaining everything, explaining the whole universe. Now, as is usually the case with this kind of scientific uh, claim, the target is God. They want to eliminate God from the conversation. But before getting to the God question, let me just make an observation. Though the sciences might be able to understand the chemical compounds that make up you know, paper and ink, the sciences will never understand the meaning of a book. Though the sciences might be able to understand the, you know, the physical makeup of the body, the sciences as such will never understand what makes an act morally good or morally evil. Though the sciences might be able to uh, break down the you know, chemical makeup of, uh, of the paint used in the, in the Sistine Chapel ceiling, they'll never be able to explain why that's a beautiful work of art. My point is that the universe, meaning the totality of finite reality, includes much more than those physical objects and events that the sciences can measure. They include such things as truth, as meaning, as value, as goodness, as beauty. They're as much a part of the universe as physical objects and events. So first of all, you've got this incredible arrogance about what the sciences can accomplish. It's not because they're relatively underdeveloped, which is why they can't understand the things I was describing. It's because those are qualitatively different types of reality, and the scientific method simply doesn't reach to that level. But, as I said, these scientific formulations are usually designed to attack God, to get rid of this you know, hopelessly antiquarian notion of God. Now, uh, Carroll's argument takes the form, really, of Laplace's famous argument. He's the guy back in the uh, early 19th century who responded to Napoleon when the emperor famously said, well, where does, where does God fit into your astronomical calculations? And Laplace said, I have no need of that hypothesis. My point there is the Laplacean thing assumes that God is one fussy cause among many. So here's my astronomical uh, schema. Here's how all the causal systems relate to each other. And I have no need of the hypothesis of a divine cause. My system is self-explanatory. The fundamental problem with both Laplace and Carroll is they don't understand what serious biblical people mean when they use the word God. The one thing God is not is one being or one cause among many. Thomas Aquinas refers to God not as ens sumum, meaning highest being, but rather ipsum esse, which means the sheer act of to be itself. Now, to explicate that a little further, I might want to revisit the famous argument from contingency for God's existence. I think it's a way not only to understand that God exists, but also what we mean when we say God. The argument begins with um, contingency. Sounds like a fancy thing. It really isn't. It just means realities that are not self-explanatory, that don't contain within themselves the reason for their own existence. So, you and I are contingent. Why? Because we're breathing, because we eat and drink, because we had parents. In other words, our being is not self-explanatory. It comes from other causes. Okay. If that's the case, then we have to look to an extrinsic cause to explain our own existence. Now, suppose those extrinsic causes themselves are contingent, as is the case with our parents, with all the food that we eat, with the air that we breathe. They, too, came from other causes. They're too conditioned by things extrinsic to themselves. Well, in that case, we have to look further. Well, this process of appealing to contingent causes, trying to explain my contingency, cannot go on indefinitely. Why? If it does, I've explained nothing at all. I've simply infinitely postponed explanation. This process must end in some reality which is not contingent, whose very nature it is to be, ipsum esse, being itself. 
This is precisely what serious believers mean by God. That's why God is not one fussy cause among many, one element within a mechanistic system. God is rather the answer to this question. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why should there be a universe at all? What finally explains contingent reality? Okay, so once we make that clarification, we eliminate the first part of, of, um, of Sean Carroll's objection. Now, as his article goes on, he seems to give some credibility to this argument um, for a first instance, the argument I just uh, rehearsed. But he makes the common scientistic mistake of identifying this cause of causes with matter or with energy or with the ever-fluctuating, expanding, and contracting universe itself. But see, here's the problem. It's simply question-begging. If you say the cause of causes, the unconditioned ground of contingency is matter, you're in a conundrum. Why? Because matter, by its very nature, is in one state rather than another. It's here rather than there. It's this color rather than that. It's this condition rather than that. To use classical language, matter is characterized by potentiality. So think of our own bodies. Think of this bookshelf behind me. It's in one particular material configuration. It could be in another one. I could burn it into ashes. I could color it differently. I could move it from place to place. The point there is we have to explain, therefore, why it's in this configuration. It's not self-explanatorily in this configuration. I have to ex appeal to an extrinsic cause. The same is true of energy. That's a more contemporary term. The same problem. Energy is in some state, some configuration, some manner of being. It could be in another. Therefore, I have to invoke an extrinsic cause to explain why it's this case rather than that. To appeal to the endlessly fluctuating or expanding or contracting universe as a whole is just as much of a non-starter. Why? Because it's simply that problem now writ large. Why is the universe expanding rather than contracting? Why is it contracting rather than expanding? Why is the fluctuating vacuum, they'll use that term sometimes, uh, in this state of fluctuation rather than that? To appeal to matter or energy is to appeal to something that's by its very nature contingent. What we have to come to finally is some reality that is radically other than the universe, which could even be in principle measured by the sciences. Now, there's my ultimate point here in this, in this commentary. The claim that the sciences can adjudicate the question of God is in itself ludicrous. Now, philosophy can shed some light on God so construed, and I've, I've just done that. But the one thing the sciences can never do is eliminate the possibility of God or disprove God in any way. Those who claim otherwise are simply guilty of a scientistic mistake.